Harvard can come out vocally in support of diversity and vocally in support of anti-racism and DEI um, while sitting upon billions and billions of dollars, uh, then we should wonder to what extent are those ideas of the ruling class or to what extent are those ideas really about radical social upheaval in the way that the administrators at Harvard claim, you know? Um, so I think if they, you know, if they cared, they would throw money at it. And I think the fact that they don't and the fact that they can support diversity and so on so vociferously um, points to the fact that these are ideas that have totally been co-opted by um, the American elite those no threat to them. Hello, everybody. This is Glenn Lowry. Uh, you've tuned into The Glenn Show. We're very happy that you have done so. Um, I teach at Brown University, uh, where I'm a professor of economics, and I'm also John Paulson Senior Fellow at the Manhattan Institute. The Manhattan Institute sponsors The Glenn Show. Every other week, my conversation partner here is John McWhorter of Columbia University and The New York Times. Uh, he's here with us this week, and uh, we're happy to welcome Tyler Austin Harper, uh, who is a literary scholar and assistant professor of environmental studies at Bates College uh, to join us in conversation this uh, today. So welcome, Tyler. Welcome, John. Thanks so much. Here, huh? You're welcome. Okay, so we're here to talk about race. We're, we're, we used to be the black guys at Blogging Heads TV before uh, we, we moved on to a new platform, but we're still the black guys. And we, we are... Uh, notorious for some of our <laughs> heterodox views. I'm, I don't know if you follow us or not, Tyler, but we're following you. Do. Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> so, Familiar with both of you. Okay, so racial gamification. Uh, this is your uh, term of art. Uh, reacting critically uh, against the uh, tenor of discussion, both on the right and, I gather, to some degree on the left, about racial diversity in higher education. Want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, what I call racial gamification is just this idea that um, we are encouraged to see our identities as either a opportunity lubricant or a source of opportunity friction, right? And so um, this sense that it can be advantageous to us in hiring or admissions or whatever um, to position ourselves in a certain way to play up or play down certain aspects of our, our racial identity, right? So. Um, I was a college admissions tutor during grad school to make money during the summers. Um, and, you know, I would have black kids that would want to make sure that their um, essay topics telegraph blackness in a certain way. Right. So they might talk about um, a particular kind of racial trauma. They might talk about uh, being stopped by the cops and the anxiety that causes or whatever. Um, and the sense I usually got was not that that was what they thought best uh, encapsulated them as a person, but rather this is what some anonymous admissions committee would want to see to make sure that, um, you know, you were someone deserving of affirmative action. Right. Um, the flip side of that, though, and the thing I'm really at pains to point out is that um, racial gamification isn't just something that minorities are compelled to do. Um, I mean, you also see it with white folks, um, you see it with Asian folks in particular, which is something I wrote about with The New York Times, um, with white kids that often took the form of um, you know, a, I may be rich and I may be white, but my dad is an alcoholic or I struggle with anxiety and depression. Right. So trying to prove that you have some kind of protected or diversity status, even though you might be a rich white kid who lives at a loft in you know, Manhattan. Um, and with Asian kids in particular, there was a lot of anxiety about um, stereotypical Asianness. So, you know, the first tutoring gig I ever had, I showed up at this um young woman's house in Flushing in Queens. Um, and she had already written all her application materials. And she gave them to me and said, I want you to look over these and make sure I don't come across as a stereotypical Asian. So we spent 20 minutes debating, is chess club too Asian? Is math club too Asian? Um, and it was a really uncomfortable exercise. And it really clued me into the way in which um, something about affirmative action, which I nonetheless broadly supported, had really gone off the rails and we've departed really severely from the spirit of affirmative action, which is about lifting up the poor um, and particularly poor minorities to something else entirely. Um, so Tyler, what, um, my problem with old school affirmative action is the idea that a very middle-class Cosby show black kid is admitted because they're diverse. I think that's so fake. The old school 
form of admission is that because you have brown skin, you are admitted. I'm okay with the idea. What's wrong with admissions based on hardship, even if the hardship comes from your race? And I'm going to. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think um, admissions based on hardship makes a great deal of sense. What I'm opposed to is the sense that um, students really feel like they need to either uh, manufacture hardship or sometimes share aspects of the personal life that they don't always want to. I think there's this. Um, trauma dumping element that's really encouraged on applications where students feel like they're supposed to recapitulate the worst things that ever happened to them in order to prove somehow that they've uh, that they're they deserve a mission. And, and part of this is about the way admissions questions tend to be asked. Um, almost all of them will ask you to talk about overcoming an obstacle. Right. Um, and that overcoming obstacle discourse, particularly at elite institutions, is really about um, giving folks uh, the opportunity to talk about diversity in, in in a way, right? And to prove that they've overcome some obstacle, uh, archetypally a, a kind of racial obstacle, right? In order to show that they, they deserve merit. But I think there's something really perverse about that. Like I said, I totally support affirmative action, um, particularly in college admissions. Um, but I think box checking is sufficient. And I, I don't think we need to make people go through this exercise where they feel compelled to contort every which way in order to show that they've uh, suffered in some way, and on the basis of that suffering, should get into Yale. Well, you totally support affirmative action, but you you may know that I don't. I do, yeah. Uh, and I'm reading you, and I'm saying, yeah, this gamification stuff is whack. But it is a natural step down the logical chain from starting point where I'm trying to compose a class of students that's quote-unquote diverse. And mm -hmm. where by that diversity, I don't mean some of them are Mormons and some of them are Jews and some of them are Catholics or some of them are conservatives and some of them are Marxists uh, or some of them are artists and, and some of them are literary people. What I mean is some of them belong in this box and some of them belong in that box. So I don't see how you do boxes without doing gamification. And I don't see why the critique of gamification doesn't reach all the way down to a critique of the boxes. What do we want from our yeah. students? We want them to be intellectually interesting. We want them to be talented. We, we want them to be creative. But why do we need them to be a Black or a Latino or an Asian or whatever? Why is that emphasis uh, so prominent in our decisions about how to allocate opportunity for elite higher education? Long question, but you, you get the idea? No. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what I would say, somebody who's on the left, is that I think... Um, the spirit of affirmative action, right, is about redressing the historical exclusion of minorities and other kinds of folks from the university. Um, that's the spirit of it, right? And so um, I'm on board with that as a, as a basic project. Um, where I think we've really gone off the rails is, is in two directions. One is through um, the lens of trauma, which is really the lens through which students are encouraged to write their application materials. And I think that's disturbing and distressing and asks people to perform a certain kind of caricature of race, racial identity, um, which I think is, is, is weird. Um, but also, I think there's been, um, as a result of uh, affirmative action, and I really don't like using the term reverse racism because it's a term that gets co-opted in certain kinds of ways, but I, I think the technical term would be reverse racism against Asian students in particular. And as somebody who's on the left, what distressed me most about tutoring in Queens was these kids who would have a 1550 SAT score, reading and math, amazing extracurriculars, whatever, um, were had to clear a much higher bar to have even a remote chance of admission at top schools, right? Um, and what frustrated me about that was not only was this a group of kids who were be, being held back on the basis of their race, it was largely a group of poor kids. Most of the Asian and Asian American students I tutored in Queens, their parents were immigrants. They were not coming from money. Their parents owned a Chinese restaurant or a dry cleaner. Um, they, they barely had the money to afford paying me to tutor their kids. Um, and yet these kids had to work much harder than basically any other group I encountered in order to have the same kinds of opportunities. Um, and that really offended me as somebody who's kind of on the Bernie Sanders swing of the spectrum, that these were not only people being held back on the basis of their race, but they were poor people being held back on the basis of their race. And, you know, the myth of affirmative action is that it's supposed to be about lifting up poor minorities. Um, 
And it's clear to me that the, the policy as practiced really didn't seem to do that. So I would distinguish, um, you know, what I would see is the spirit of affirmative action versus the sort of practical reality of how it was instantiated as a policy. Well, I want to give John a chance, but there's something I don't understand here, which is, I mean, because there's a flip side of that. The black kids who are coming to elite colleges are not uh, on the whole poor kids. They're kids that are coming from relatively Absolutely. advantaged homes. Why isn't this a cri- argument, the basis of a critique of affirmative action to court? Because I can imagine a version of affirmative action that is uh, not nearly subjectable. I think um, the history of American slavery and Jim Crow and what gets called structural racism is an ugly history uh, and our history is imperfect. And I tend to think that the policies uh, redress that history. It might make sense that they're also imperfect and ugly. I don't think affirmative action is a perfect system. I don't think there's any way to make it a perfect system. And I, I wouldn't argue that you can. I think, Glenn, I totally agree with your, you know, the turtles all the way down, point, right? That I think there is some inherent trade-off to affirmative action, um, even in a kind of minimal um, or, or in a way that achieves the spirit of affirmative action. I think I'm willing to countenance those trade-offs on the whole. Um, it, if we could imagine a system that was more narrowly geared toward lifting up for minority. Um, and to your point, our system, the, the one that was just you know dismantled, did not do that in the slightest. Uh, you know, I went to Haverford College outside of Philly, a kind of, you know, fancy liberal arts college. Um, and I arrived, someone from the working class, imagining that the other black students I encountered would be members of the working class. And they were from Greenwich, Connecticut, and they drove Lexuses. Uh, one of them uh, was family friends with Barack Obama, who he would see during the summers. Uh, and it became really clear to me. And this is the other flip side of racial gamification. It's not just something that college students it's also something that colleges do, right? So Haverford College was able to admit a bunch of wealthy black kids um, and get, uh, you know, kind of two for one deal, you know, where they had, they got the kid who could smile on the brochure, but they also got someone who could pay full tuition, right? Um, and so, you know, my critique of affirmative action as practice would be a class critique, that it, it was not helping largely uh, poor minorities. It was helping the middle and upper class uh, minorities who mostly could already pay their way and who went to fancy prep schools like Andover and Exeter, um, you know, just lacking on advantage that those kids already have. Um, and so, you know, as practiced, I, I would not support affirmative action at all. The, the distinction I'm, I'm making, Glenn, is I can imagine a version of affirmative action that is less objectionable um, and that I would be willing to support it despite its downside. I, I can't imagine a perfect system. Uh, emissions are, by definition, a zero-sum game, right? And if you're giving a leg up to some, you're inherently you know, pushing down others. That's just how the math works. Um, but I can imagine a version of it that is less morally objectionable and where the, the pros might outweigh the cons. That's very not, much not the system we have, though. So okay. how, about, how about this? Stage yeah. one affirmative action is affirmative action applies to all roughly black and Latino people, especially as they're more Latinos, because to be black or Latino is essentially to be disadvantaged. This is 1966. I don't think anybody significant had a problem with that, although it didn't work out well. Stage two is, for example, what I knew at UC Berkeley in the 90s. I'm noticing now that the people who were there are losing memory of what it was like. But I remember I was there. UC Berkeley in the 1990s, where the idea was there's not going to be the old kind of racial preferences anymore. It's going to be about, about, um, it's going to be about hardship, but in practice, it's going to be black and Latino hardship. We don't care about Asian hardship. Now you can understand the impulse there, but that was problematic too, because by then there's so many Asians who grow up poor. That more. So then stage three is now where I think that the good thinking idea is going to be, okay, affirmative action is about hardship in general. And I, I speak up for that. And so even if you're white, you know, you, if you grew up hard, then you get it. But people don't seem to like that very much either. And so stage four would be, and Glenn, you might like this, let go of this <laughs> idea that you gamify. Let go, and, and Tyler, you too, let go of this idea that now when you write your essay, you're supposed to write about, like if you grew up in Greenwich, Connecticut, maybe your dad was an alcoholic, you had it hard. And so what was your problem? Because the truth is almost everybody has problems. So is it step four 
going to be, I mean, very honestly, you could write an essay where you said, because of a glandular condition I have, I weigh 400 pounds. My life is very difficult. Admit me. But I, that would make a certain sense. So next is no more hardship. It's just, it's gla gla I don't mean to caricature you, but the idea is what were your scores? How good are you? It doesn't matter whether somebody drank or whether you're brown or whether the cops pulled you over. How good are you? Is that where we're supposed to go? And I ask that question of both of you. Well, I can respond. Glenn, game you respond? Yeah, was, yeah. Rough, roughly, roughly. Yeah. I mean, good, good is not a one dimensional thing. Now it's not just a test score, but it's about the intellectual imperative of what the institution is about. It's about acquiring knowledge. It's about reflecting on text. It's about making arguments. It's about expanding my understanding, my mastery. It's intellectual work. It's a university. It's, it, it, it's not a summer camp. It's not a social club. That's a secondary aspect. Now, of course, kids come together on the campus. They will be socializing. They will learn lessons and so forth and so on. And administration can't be indifferent to all of that, but it should not be as fundamental to their understanding of how to constitute themselves as it is. I mean, I want to talk about why it is that these uh, working class Asian kids come in there with the test scores so great that they have to be discriminated against in order to keep them out. And conversely, why it is that the kids who summer with the Obamas need a leg up to get into Haverford College. Why, why? That's the more fundamental issue. And, you know, we're way downstream the human developmental process here. We're talking about 18 to 22 year olds um, and we're trying to do social policy by structuring the composition of a university, which is a special kind of institution that late in the developmental dynamic of a young person's life. Uh, and it comes at the end of the day to me to look like virtue signaling and bean counting. And, and I'm against that. I mean, that's very crude, but but. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, what I would say to that point is, um, you know, I'm somebody who benefited from affirmative action. I also benefited from doing really well in the SATs. My high school GPA was fine. I was more interested in playing guitar and doing other things than I was in, in being a diligent student. But my SAT scores were really good. And so I think, you know, um, and historically, SAT scores have often helped, um, you know, uh, right minorities from, you know, places without a lot of opportunity. And so I, I, I hear what you're saying about the score piece. I guess the, the flip side, I would say, Glenn, as somebody who's done a lot of um, college admissions and done a lot of SAT tutoring and, and a lot of GRE tutoring for grad school as well, is that um, I've seen firsthand the way in which uh, wealthy people can, or, or motivated people, uh, motivated parents can throw an awful lot of money at their kids, uh, at boosting their kids' scores. Um, and so I think there's a really important class piece here too. And that's what I, I really like the stages you sketched out, John, and something that, you know, that third stage you sketch, sketched out about hardship I would broadly support class-based affirmative action. Um, and I think class-based affirmative action is a better form of affirmative action than race-based affirmative action. Um, uh, but nonetheless, I, I'm not as comfortable with just a pure, um, in a perfect world where your score was actually your score and wasn't inflected in any way with a whole host of other benefits upstream that you've had, I'd totally be down with saying the score is the score. This is a meritocracy. Um, but I've seen the ugly underbelly of meritocracy, which is that people who have penthouses in the Manhattan skyline spend thousands upon thousands of dollars boosting their kids, uh, you know, relatively mediocre kids SAT score from a 1200 to a 1400. And so I don't think it's um, I think we have to consider that someone with a 1200 SAT score with no test prep uh, versus a kid with a 1350 SAT score whose parents have thrown untold ungodly amounts of money at them. They might be roughly equivalent applicants, you know, and so uh, I think a class based um, sort of approach makes a great deal more sense to me. Class, as opposed to you mean hardship, because, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. So class would be better. And so have you gotten any flack from making your argument that it should be about socioeconomics that really offends a lot of people these days? I think it offends a lot of people in the media. I have gotten not a lot of flack either personally or via email. Um, both the Atlantic and the New York Times piece generated just clogs my inbox for weeks. Um, I genuinely did not get a single defense of um, affirmative action as it was practiced. I didn't get a single defense of 
what I was critical in the New York Times piece with the Atlantic piece about diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives and the way those are practiced, I've gotten zero pushback. Um, and I think that is in part because a lot of people, including a great deal of black people, and I heard from many black people who were saying, I think the same thing. You know, I think a lot of people see it for what it is. And if you look at the hallway, right, um, a slight majority of African Americans were in favor of affirmative action, but it was not overwhelming, and plenty do not. And that number really goes up when you ask when you ask the question in such a way that is about that makes it clear what affirmative action does, right? Um, which is giving a leg up or a leg down on the basis of race. And so I, I actually think um, you know people have also tried to cast me as a sort of heterodox person, and I don't think that's a slur uh, for for either of you, just for the record. But I don't think I've really said anything that's actually outside of the mainstream of what most people, including most black people, think. I think it's outside of the mainstream within the media because you never hear from black people who are like, you know, I don't I don't know about it from action. And you never hear from black people who have, um, you know, substantial criticisms of, of the corporatization of DEI. For Is I um, ask? Oh, go so, ahead. Oh, oh I no, asked no, you ahead. that question, frankly, it's very manipulative. I wanted you to say that. Because <laughs> I, I, I could say the same thing, but people seem to think that I'm somehow not representative. My sense is that out on the scene, most people, you know, informed or not, agree with exactly what you're saying. The pushback is from a very small set of disproportionately influential people, mostly in university bureaucracies, in academia, and in the media. I did an event um, a few weeks ago where I must admit I was caught a little bit short because I'm so used to presenting that class-based idea to audiences of color, both virtually and real, and people basically understanding that it's no longer 1990. And I found, no, actually I had to do some work and I got some major pushback, nothing horrible, but I thought the problem is that these are people within a certain very narrow sphere and I'm not, and what those people think, and I don't mean it in a cynical way, they think they know better yeah than the person sitting and reading The Atlantic who doesn't actually work in the industry. I'm not sure they do. What I, what I saw was a kind of ideological resistance or maybe a fear that to speak the new truth would mean that they would take flack from people who work alongside them. I have full respect for them, but no, what you're saying is true. The country has moved, including people of color and how this sort of thing is seen. And this idea that the Obamas diver deserve affirmative action, you could call it that shorthand because they're black. That's obsolete. Yeah. The Obamas would have deserved affirmative yeah. action in 1966, the equivalence of them, but not, not now. Yeah. Okay, guys, I, uh, this is uh, devil's advocate here. So class, not race for affirmative action doesn't work. There's way, way, way more poor white people than there are poor black people. Moreover, the... Uh, uh, the uh, development of the intellectual uh, ab the abilities and whatnot depend on class to a certain degree. So if I restricted my attention to poor people, I'd be looking at a relatively less distinguished uh, uh, set from which to uh, uh, choose my admittees. Uh, so if I want to have racial diversity, and I'm saying I'm going after it using a class-based system, that's a disconnect. I don't I don't think you can get there from here. I think the number of black kids at the elite schools would go down if you were to switch from race to class as a basis for affirmative action, uh, every bit as much as it would if you got rid of affirmative action altogether. I think that's true. And I think there's historical precedent for that. You mentioned the UC system, particularly Berkeley. I think U Michigan is another one where um, they've removed uh, affirmative action based on race. I think an ideal system would in include both, right? I mean, there's always a lot of blathering about intersectionality, right? The idea that we need to understand ourselves as a composite of identities. Um, but it doesn't seem that progressives often really live up to that. Um, and I, I actually think it genuinely sort of intersectional affirmative action would include look at race plus class, right? Um, because I think both are important and can carry aspects of, of disadvantage. Um, I would tilt more toward class than race. But you're right in terms of absolute numbers. There's a lot more poor white people um, and that, you know, uh, places where pure class based affirmative action has been tried. Um, the numbers of minorities have really fallen. But I think, you know, uh, a policy targeted at the intersection of those two 
uh, would make a great deal of sense. And I also think that would eliminate the obverse problem, which is that you have a lot of black kids from Greenwich, Connecticut, and you have a lot of very wealthy uh, African immigrants at Harvard University um, who, you know, are, are, I'm sure, earn their place just like anybody else. But it doesn't seem to me to be about this project of uplift that the myth of affirmative action centers on. There was one uh, aspect of your argument in the New York Times about affirmative action that really struck me. I can't remember exactly how you put it, but basically you say, if the institutions offer a solution, a proposed solution that doesn't involve them putting some real money in place, then uh, bet, bet on that not being uh, a solution to the problem. So you, you, totally, you think, yeah. I mean, and I'm reminded of uh, my friend, former student and colleague, Roland Fryer's uh, piece in the Times, roughly around the same time that yours appeared, in which he challenged the Ivies to dip into their endowments and create academies in inner city neighborhoods around the country that would find diamond in the rough, talented kids who might be a little, you know, undeveloped around the edges and would bring them up to speed so that they could get admitted to places like Bates or Brown or whatever on the merits without having to have a affirmative action dispensation. Uh, so do, do you think, I mean, can you expand on your concern about the cynicism? I, I don't want to put words in your mouth. No, no, Insincerity no. of these uh, virtue signaling institutions who aren't really serious about uh, expanding opportunities for uh, people of color. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think um, there's a lot of lip service paid to ideas that are supposedly about diversity, equity, and inclusion, or about anti-racism, or about you know diversity um, that are 100 percent free and cost universities nothing or very little conceived that in, in relation to um, the amount of money they have access to, right? But that sounds good. And Haberberg can say we are X, Y, Z percent black, and that's much more black than the average elite liberal arts college. And meanwhile, that hasn't really, uh, they haven't had to dig into their bottom line much to, to, uh, to make that happen, right? And so I think um, if universities really care about diversity, I think an approach like that makes a great deal of sense, right? Harvard um, has an endowment that is much larger than many medium-sized countries' GDP, right? So they could certainly afford to, um, you know, establish schools and, uh, you know, poor neighborhoods uh, and, you know, do the work of actually throwing money at um, this issue, right? Um, but I also think, uh, Glenn, you, you, you use the, I think, phrase um, diamond in the rough. I think that's really important. And I think it's um, many Black people uh, and many poor people, um, it would never even occur to them to apply to a place like Harvard, even if they have really good scores and test scores, right? Um, I did not apply to Ivy's uh, because it didn't occur to me to apply to Ivy's. Um, knowing what I know now with the scores I had, I would have had a good shot at most of them um, on the basis of my race, right? But, you know, the poor people don't often um, see themselves as having access to opportunity. And so I think there's a, a whole other problem of sort of finding talent, which there are plenty of brilliant kids at schools around the country um, where there is not a, a culture at the school of, of kids applying to elite institutions. And so they just don't apply. Right. And so but that's that's a resources problem. And so if, you know, some of these schools with uh, billions upon billions of dollars in their endowment really cared, they'd throw some money at it. Um, and, you know, I uh, uh, love your ears, Glenn, but I often say I'm a, a kind of soft Marxist. But what I mean by that is not that I advocate the overthrow of the existing order, the installation of the dictatorship of the proletariat, but rather that I think the ideas that proliferate at a given time tend to be ideas that it that work in the favor of the people in charge, or at minimum, don't threaten them. And I think if um, Harvard can come out vocally in support of diversity and vocally in support of anti-racism and DEI, um, while sitting upon billions and billions of dollars, uh, then we should wonder to what extent are those ideas of the ruling class or to what extent are those ideas really about radical social upheaval in the way that the administrators at Harvard claim, you know? Um, so I think if they, you know, they cared, they would throw money at it. And I think the fact that they don't and the fact that they can support diversity and so on so vociferously um, points to the fact that these are ideas that have totally been co-opted by um, the American elite posed no threat to them. You know, Tyler, remind it. No, I'll just be very quick, Brad. Jay Caspian Kang, the writer, came on my show a few weeks ago and he made an observation about yeah, listen, elite right. colleges that I thought was spot on. He said, you know, it's really all about the rich kids. 
they, they bring in the high scoring Asian kids because they're supposed to be a super elite place and everybody's supposed to be a genius. So they got to have some geniuses around. They bring in the black and brown kids because they're supposed to be socially virtuous and they got to be on the right side of history. So they need to have some minorities around. But at the core of it, it's about the rich kids. Everything else is the tail that the dog is wagging kind of thing like that. I, I think there's something to that. I, I uh, No, I listened to that episode and I, I totally agree with that when he said it. Absolutely. It's spot on. You know, John, John and I often talk about higher education on this podcast. Obviously, that's the universe we both inhabit. And why not? It's a topic that has moved front and center of late at both the state and national level. Free speech on campus, viewpoint diversity on campus, cancel culture on campus, soaring tuition, affirmative action, race-based admissions, accreditation, the erosion of standards, attacks on the classics, hiring litmus tests, critical race theory, diversity, equity, and inclusion, you name it, it's in the news. So with all that's going on, and there's a lot going on, to whom can one turn as a trusted resource of all issues related to campus reform, whether you're a student, faculty, trustee, administrator, donor, policymaker, or alumni? One source we want you to know about and strongly recommend as a credible and respected voice on all these issues is the American Council of Trustees and Alumni, or ACTA, whom we're pleased to have supporting this episode. ACTA is on the front lines, promoting academic excellence, academic freedom, and accountability at America's colleges and universities. They don't just serve as trusted advisors to college trustees and alumni. They help arm reformers with resources, ideas, recommendations, information, even grassroots alumni support through their Campus Freedom Initiative. They make positive changes happen, and they approach these issues in a nonpartisan, balanced, informed, highly credible way, which we appreciate. If you care deeply about these issues, as John and I do, you really must know more about the American Council of Trustees and Alumni. Start by looking them up on the web at goacta.org. That's goacta.org. And follow them on Twitter and Facebook. Father, what has the feedback been on the piece that you did, I believe, for The Atlantic? about white people or especially about the past three years being very careful to acknowledge to us that they understand what a tragedy it is for us every day to walk around as black people and that it kind of gets on your nerves because that was a brave people often call me brave not you were brave to write that piece because i'm sure it a lot of white people really wouldn't know what to do with it and my sense of things is that a lot of black people do wish to be treated that way, that they'd like the idea of somebody thinking that we spend our lives walking around being assaulted in various ways. Have you heard from anybody who has said that you're a little too ahead of the curve or that you're being a heartless or that you're, you're letting white people slide back to the way they were? Because I feel exactly like you. I am nauseated when somebody does that acknowledgement of the burden of my upper middle class, frankly, successful blackness where any, you know, ra where racism affects me, it's probably one and a half times a year and has nothing to do with the consciousness of any remotely consciously healthy person. And I'm, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I get the feeling that's roughly your life too. What's the feedback? Yeah, yeah. So the feedback has been basically the same as the New York Times piece. No one has been critical. I'm sure some, it, upset some people. I, I don't think they've uh, yet figured out what to say about it, even if it's sort of an emotional, in an emotional way upset some. I've gotten no negative feedback. I've heard from a lot of people positively. The closest I've gotten to negative feedback has been people writing or people I've talked to that have said, you know, okay, you don't want me to bring up race all the time, but then sometimes people do want to talk about race and some of my black friends want to talk about it a lot and other of my black friends don't seem to, so what do I do? Uh, and my response is, you know, you got to treat them like people. And, and so much, uh, I think the anxiety around um, interracial social etiquette is that white people feel a profound and overwhelming guilt and sense of powerlessness, but also complicity at what they see as American history and ongoing problems around police brutality or whatever. 
and they just want someone to tell them what to do. They want a fixed set of rules so that they can they can do the thing they're supposed to do to make them not racist. You know, um, I'm often reminded. Uh, I'm a big fan of the French psychoanalyst Jack Lacan, and he has this great line where he says. Um, neurosis has the structure of a question, which sounds like a bit of academies, but what he means is that people who are neurotic experience their whole world as um, anxiety about who they are, what is their place within society and the, within the social order, what do authorities want from me, what does my boss want from me, what am I supposed to do? Um, and they, they're constantly anxious about who they are and what to do, and here comes anti-racism and DEI and says, Here's a fixed set of rules you can follow that will mean you're not racist and that will also signal to everyone else you're not racist, you know? Um, and so the main pushback I've gotten has been like, well, some black people do want me to talk about race. Other people don't. How am I supposed to know? And I think that expresses this anxiety about an absence of rules, right? If we pulled back from this particular kind of interpersonal anti-racism, People would have to exercise judgments about, you know, and take cues from black folks about when they do and do not want to talk about race. You know, and the point I've made is sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. And I'll let you know when I do, you know. Um, but I think I think that makes people deeply uncomfortable because they would have to exercise judgment. And they just you realize to- that it's harder for the white person here than it is for us in any way, because there's a kind of black person who is upset if you are not acknowledging race all the time. It is their entire I hate to say, you might want to call it that they're living amidst Lacan's sense of what neurosis is. I hate to say it. But then there's a kind of black person who really, frankly, doesn't want to hear it except under extraordinary conditions. And that's, that's certainly me. Then there are people who are in yeah. between. And the white person has to also decide, do they believe this? Because a lot of them really mm-hmm. don't believe in all of this oversensitivity. Then some of them very much believe in it. And then they would have to put up with somebody like me. I think most of them know to an extent that a lot of the exaggerated version of this is an act, but is it out of being a civilized white person to pretend? And is that what we're telling them to do? Pretend to believe something that you know is to an extent a kind of performance art. That's tough. It was easier 50 years ago for all of us in a way. I would not want to go back there, but that's sure. tough. That's really tough. You know, and I think I, I'm um, I think I'm a little less cynical than you in the sense that I, I at least I know a lot of really true believers, right? Like w- white folks who really believe the whole, uh, you know, the whole anti-racism uh, sort of etiquette. They're not acting. No. And then there's like another kind of person, too, who uh, knows that you have to go through a certain, kind of, you know, the motions in order to be, you know, accepted the right way in whatever workplace wherever you're enmeshed in. Um, but in my experience, uh, in yours or other people's might be different, in my experience, I mostly encounter true believers who really feel guilty as white people and who desperately want to feel less guilty. And so they're just clawing and scraping for anything, um, someone to tell them what to do, right? To issue a demand and say, just do this and then everything will be fine. Um, so I think some people are cynical and have learned the rules and know all the jargon and lets them get by in their workplace and in their performance reviews or whatever. But mostly I experience people who really believe, and that might be symptomatic of the social circles in which I travel, um, but, you know, I, I encounter more true believers in this. Okay, I have a question. Uh, the uh, editors at The Atlantic titled your piece, uh, I'm a black professor, but you don't need to mention it. Something like that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you go... Not my title. But yeah, yeah, I assume not. <laughs> but it's clever. I think that's an AI, uh, AI generated one. And you, you draw a distinction. You draw a distinction between a color blindness in policy and a color blindness in social intercourse as uh, uh, goals that one might put forward as ideals. You reject the former. Color blindness in policy is not what you're talking about, and you hope to buy yourself a hearing from your progressive audience as you advocate for the, it seems to me, for the latter, a de-emphasis on color in our informal social relations. And my question is, can you really have it both ways? Uh, Aren't those things symbiotically intertwined with one another? If we do policy in terms of race, don't we perforce invite uh, personal relations in terms of race? Um, That's my question. Yeah, I, I think that's a really good question. Um, I would argue that 
the argument for colorblind, uh, the argument against colorblindness in law and policy is very different than the argument against colorblindness as an interpersonal ethos. I think they're entwined, and I think there's ways in which they feed back to one another, Glenn. I, I don't deny that, but I think they're, they rest on fundamentally separate arguments, right? I mean, the first is a political argument about the way in which that on certain kinds of race neutral laws, going back to even the Homestead Act, but also the Fair Housing Act, the GI Bill, whatever. Um, might officially be race neutral, but then in practice tended to have uh, racialized uh, impacts that were differential, right? Um, that's a very different argument um, saying that, you know, race consciousness and law is sometimes anything, but that's a really different argument from saying that, you know, interpersonally between two friends or two colleagues around the water cooler, um, you know, it's racist not to acknowledge racial difference, right? And that professing not to see color is a, is a dog whistle. I mean, on this last point, Coleman Hughes has been really good, where he, you know, points out that there's this kind of pace of terminal literalism a lot of people get, where they're like, obviously you see color, you have two eyes in your head, we acknowledge, we can see race, the brain picks up race within milliseconds or whatever. And that's not what anyone means when they say, I, I don't see color, they mean I try to treat everyone the same. Um, and there's a big difference to me between pointing out that uh, the law often doesn't treat everyone the same, and institutions like banks or police departments often don't treat everyone the same, despite the rhetoric of race neutrality. There's a huge difference that, from that in saying that we shouldn't aspire to treat everyone the same in our interpersonal reaction. So I don't deny that there's ways in which, um, particularly in workplaces, I think, where that can be a really difficult line to straddle. But nonetheless, I think we used to straddle it a lot more than we do now. You know, I mean, my race comes up infinitely more post George Floyd than it did pre George Floyd when I talked to progressives, you know, um, and those same progressives back then would have critiqued colorblind law policy. So obviously there's been this um, sort of metastasism of critiques of colorblindness that's gone from just this political claim about the way that certain race neutral laws aren't race neutral toward colorblindness as such is bad. Um, and it's this slippage from politics to sort of social psychology that I find both um, bizarre and a, and a kind of mismatch. I, I don't think those two claims have much to do with one another. So I think there's an argument. I'm okay. sorry, John. You go ahead. Tyler, I just wanted to ask you something. Um, how are you doing in terms of um, being an academic and even not even associate, but assistant and saying these against the grain things? It's a question that I get a lot and I have a very eccentric story and the answer is none. But then again, I've had an odd timing. And by the time I started speaking out, I already had tenure. I don't teach in a political science department. But in your case, are you afraid that you're going to interfere with your chances of advancement because you're not saying the proper things? Or are we getting to the point where that's just not as true as it used to be? That was going to be my question. Um, I don't know about that historical claim that it not being as true as it used to be. Maybe it is, maybe it is. I don't know. I would say I work, uh, Bates College is an idiosyncratic place. Um, it is in Maine. We are not in New Hampshire, but uh, there is a kind of live free or die ethos that I think prevails in Maine as it does in New Hampshire. And so there is a lot of room for rethinking at Bates. Um, and, you know, I also would say that the college is really committed to um, thinking about policies and practices that actually have an impact on students, right? So uh, I, I think compared to other colleges and universities I've, I've encountered, been at, or, or familiar with through friends, Bates does a really good job at thinking very hard about the distinction between performative signaling and, um, you know, policies of the institution that are going to make a difference in the lives of students, you know? And so I'm really focused on a, a critique of performative signaling. I'm on board with the policy stuff, not across the board, but for the most part, I'm on board with um, most, you know, higher education policy stuff around race. Um, and, and what I'm really trying to tease out is this um, decoration of performative signaling uh, we have on top of that. And I think Bates is a place is already predisposed to thinking hard about um, how to move in the direction of, of real, uh, you know, policies that accomplish real things for real students rather than just, you know, PR signaling. Um, so I haven't gotten pushback or uh, been worried about my job um, in the slightest. I think in another place, I would be much more, but I think because of the particular institutional culture at Bates, um, that, that hasn't been- it, I, mean, guess it's, it's, it's been I guess it helps express yeah. results. That you, what you're talking about is justice for real people. That's an important emphasis. Glenn, go ahead, sir. 
Yeah, yeah. Now, I was going to change the subject a little bit as we wind down and um, ask Tyler, a literary scholar uh, and a man interested in writing about race and society, teaching in a department of environmental studies. Sure. What's up with that? Yeah, I didn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I teach in an interdisciplinary environmental studies department. Um, we have uh, humanities folks, social science folks, and scientists. Um, I teach uh, environmental literature and film. Um, what my work is on, I don't work on race at all, actually. Um, I'm interested in um, the way our ideas about human extinction have changed over time, particularly since the 19th century. So I work between literature and the history of science to look at how uh, in literature and social theory and scientific discourse, our ideas about um, the end of the human species have changed uh, from about 1800 to 1945, when we drop the atomic bomb and, and extinction becomes a kind of public policy question in a new way. Um, but that's why I'm in an environmental studies department. I'm, I'm looking at this relationship between the history of science, literature, um, and other types of discourses, um, and that has an environmental bent to it. Um, so that's why I'm there. I don't do anything with uh, race really in my uh, in my academic. And so life. you are someone who is deeply concerned with a policy that is all about race. But in your actual studies, what you're doing is you're indulging basic human curiosity and just studying stuff. I cannot tell you how deeply I admire you for that. That's, <laughs> oh, thank I you. really, really respect that. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. I've had to really, um, not at Bates, but at other institutions really push back against, um, folks who really wanted me to study black stuff. Um, and, you know, I do a lot of 19th century British literature and looking at dead white men, and I've gotten a lot of uh, anger about here. that. So I've really had to fight for a corner where, where I, I do stuff that's not related to race, and that's about what I'm interested in. So I, I appreciate that. Thank you. So the contemporary concern about climate and uh, the planet going forward is uh, found uh, centuries earlier in the literary canon where people are concerned about extinction. Yeah, not climate change in particular, but people have been worried about human extinction, um, which I would distinguish in important ways from apocalypticism, right? People have worried about the end of the world for thousands of years, but in a religious idiom, right, where um, the end of the world is a kind of divine event, right? But beginning in the early 19th century, you have people worried about extinction from um, sort of naturalistic or, or human-made causes, right? So not from a divine cause, but, you know, the sun blinking out or... Um, you know, environmental devastation or, or technological change or whatever. Um, and so uh, I'm really interested in tracing the emergence of this secular idea of the end of the world, both from environmental issues, but also things like technology. Even in the 19th century, you have sort of some proto concern about things like AI and artificial intelligence. Um, and so, you know, these are all ideas, obviously, we're really worried about the 21st century. And my project is just trying to show that you know, Elon Musk worrying about AI and extinction or our concerns about climate change are part of a longer history of worry that goes back to the 19th century. Really, really cool. I second John in encouraging you to carry on and uh, admire what you're doing. And thank you for giving time to join us in conversation here at The Glenn Show. So thanks very much, Tyler. Oh, it's been great. Yeah, thank you both. So long. Thanks. All right, John. <laughs> that is, that is my God. Okay, I, refreshing, huh? <laughs> I have no idea what he thinks of us or of me, but that is where things are supposed to go. I, I, I like the cut of his jib. That's that works for me. What about you? Well, yeah, I would uh, second that. Uh, I think he probably thinks we're okay, wrongheaded in certain respects, but nevertheless, you know, not too shabby. Otherwise, he probably wouldn't have even given us the time of day. Uh, that's so that's I, I, the thinking yeah. person. Yeah. He has, he's anticipated arguments. He's got the camera pulled back. He's interested in things. And yet he's also interested in race at the same time. He knows how to answer a question that I, yeah, I'm glad you invited him. That was great. Well, uh, I, I will say I have been persuaded by my wife to invite Sabrina Salvati uh, Sabby Sabs is her handle. She's a influencer and podcaster based in Boston, a left yeah. of uh, center a person who comments on all manner of things. Most recently on the debate between Cornell West presidential candidate and Jimmy Dore, comedian and uh, left wing uh, critic and uh, um, uh, Internet personality. Jimmy Dore has a big following at his 
podcast, and you may have never heard of him, have you? I don't think I have. Yeah. Okay. But he's very popular on the left. And uh, my wife, being a woman of the left, uh, follows him. And anyway, Jimmy Dore and Cornell West uh, did an hour long conversation in which Cornell was being consistently attacked from the left. Cornell was too friendly to the Biden administration. Cornell's formulation is Trump is a fascist and Biden is a milk toast uh, neoliberal Democrat, and I'm against both of them. And Jimmy Dore's position was Biden is also a fascist. He wants to pursue war everywhere. He's a military guy. He's in bed with Wall Street. He's whatever. And it's like a pox on both your houses from Jimmy Dore's position of far left. Anyway, I'm mentioning a lot of names, Cornel West, Jimmy Dore, Sabi Salvati. Uh, but she has made a point out of uh, engaging this debate between Cornel West and his left-wing critic, Jimmy Dore. And my wife is very much in award of her uh, for that, because my wife shares the view that uh, a pox on both your uh, houses in terms of Democrats and Republicans there's not much of a difference between the two, a difference that Cornell is keen to emphasize. And I'm just trying to figure out, <laughs> as I sit here a few days before my interview with the estimable uh, Sabby Sabs, how I'm going to effectively engage that conversation. My strategy on something like that yes. is to look up all the things, well, not all the things, look up representative things that she does and I'm sure you've done this. Just get a sense of what she's likely to say, what her, what her big lines are likely to be, and just anticipate. Have I sometimes have it on a piece of paper. Three responses to what this person is likely going to come up with. And the idea is not to have some sort of battle to the death, but to never be surprised. I, I did an episode of um, The View probably about a year and a half ago. And I was warned about one person on the view. And so I just looked this person <laughs> up and got a sense of the cut of her jib. And I thought, okay, what is it that she's going to say where she thinks she's going to deep six me? And to tell the truth, I went with those three things in my head and I said them before she talked. Just to, 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 I figured I'm going to say, this is what I think. And it did neutralize her because she wasn't expecting me to have responses to the things she was going to bring up. You know, she thought I didn't know what societal racism was, et cetera. So that's, that, that's all. Just, as you know, don't, don't be surprised. That's, that would be what I would do. Yeah, well, that's what I'm doing. I want to I'm, I'm still, hmm. yeah, it's, <laughs> it's going to be interesting and I look forward to it. And, and she's impressive, I must say. So I'm trying to so soften her up now with this. Uh, <laughs> actually, this uh, recording is not going to uh, air until after uh, our encounter. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Oh, that's I think that's about it. Yeah. All right. So I, I think we've uh, engaged uh, for a, a re reasonable period of time here. We can call it quits if we like. Uh, we, we, something we else on your mind. I've got two dogs at my feet. <laughs> I've got two children who need to be entertained. And um, so, yes, I think. And, and folks, they are not my dogs. I'm somewhere else. But yes, I think maybe we have come to a close. All right, John, we'll talk again in a couple of weeks. Very good. Take care.